ministering this morning. Bless us as we listen to uh, your word spoken, read, and taught. And Lord, bless us as we spend time uh, worshiping you. May our focus of what's going on in our lives just be laid at your feet. And may we focus at the truth, the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus Christ. This morning, we ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning? You're our breakthrough. You're our breakthrough. 
you 
Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, the Messiah, move forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell? who paid the ultimate price to advance God's kingdom, considering it an honor and a privilege to give even their very lives to spread the gospel. On February 7, 2017, they shot and killed Pastor John Paul. He knew the danger, and yet he also knew the call of God. Pastor John Paul is a wonderful example of someone who considered the worth of Christ to be more than the value of his very life. Um. We just sang that in a mighty fortress. The body they may kill. God's truth is living still. Abide it still. His kingdom is forever. Uh, Pastor John Paul, there's been a, a handout that's been texted out to all of you um, who are who are um, on the Calvary text system. There's also a handout that Phil's been handing out about the Day of the Martyrs. Uh, we're going to pray tomorrow night. So that's Monday, 7 o'clock, over in the prayer room. Unless we get too many people and we need to come out here, which would be a good problem to have. And we're going to pray for those who have lost their lives, those churches. We're also going to pray for those who are in jeopardy of losing their lives um, for the gospel. Pastor John Paul died because he preached Christ. It is still illegal in, the, in what we call the Muslim world or countries that are dominated by Islam to convert from Islam to anything else. And if you become a Christian, there's a a target on you. Um, we as Westerners, I will say myself, maybe not you, I am not used to this kind of interaction with people. But this is the way it is in many parts of the world. Naming the name of Christ leads uh, to death. And so we're going to get together and we're going to pray because our brothers and sisters, some of whom are outside our cultural and our linguistic context, who still are our brothers and sisters because they have the same Heavenly Father, are in jeopardy, and we want to pray for them, and we want to remember those who have passed. And some say that it's um, near the day when the Apostle Paul would have been martyred for his faith. So 
Um, there's some debate on that, but some say that too. So it's why they picked this time. So tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, come here for prayer, and we're going to pray for those who have, uh, who have suffered and martyred, been martyred. And like I said, it was texted out, and it's also Phil's handing out those brochures, which will give you some instruction about how to pray for those who are ministering and serving the Lord outside our cultural context. All right? A uh, couple other announcements quickly. Uh, I was kind of loving the last song we sang, because if those of you who are going through Revelation with us and went through Revelation 5, you know that that song, who is worthy to open the seals and break the scroll, the Lion of Judah who conquered the grave, that is right from Revelation 5. So I'm hoping that you all sat there and went, I know that, right? That's, I just love that, you know? So it's biblical. So we're going to be in 6, Revelation 6, on Tuesday night. Again, you're welcome to come here or wa watch it live on Facebook or later on YouTube. But the, the key is, is that we're going to open the Bible and we're going to keep going through the seals. We covered the first seal last week, which I told you is the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness. A little bit of the second seal, we're going to go back and go over the second seal and just kind of go through the four horsemen of the apocalypse and then keep working through those seals in Revelation 6. With the shortened week because of 4th of July, we're not going to have our normal Wednesday night prayer meeting uh, and women's Bible study is not going to meet either this Thursday. So do look, if you haven't sent your, us your contact information, please text it to 937-618-3030 uh, because we, if the weather's good, uh, one night this weekend, we'd like to have uh, a church kind of uh, impromptu fire where we throw up a tent, and, you know, a shelter and have a fire and not underneath the shelter, don't, don't get me wrong, but, you know, and just kind of hang out together. We can bring our own food and if you want to bring a game and just spend some time together. So keep an eye open for that, whether permitting. All right. So those are a few things that are going on um, that I wanted to tell you about. Uh, I want to go to prayer. And as we do, um, there's a, a few names that I want to just give you to put on your prayer list. Uh, you have Dennis Hatcher and he's working through cancer treatment. And uh, right now he's got an infection in his arm, so he can't continue the cancer treatment until that's resolved. Um, also, there's a a friend that Tremaine has that she's been sharing Christ with that's going for brain surgery. So pray for that and pray for Tremaine and, and, and how she witnesses to that individual. Um, those are a couple things that are on our hearts. So let's go to prayer. Lord, we thank you that every nation and tongue, every tribe, every people group, Lord, um, that John, as he is in heaven, looks around the throne and sees this multitude, a myriad, as it says in our translation, it says a myriad of people worshiping um, you. And so we are so grateful because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you are the King uh, of, uh, Lord, of our hearts, of this church. And Lord, we ask you that you'd work in these situations. Father, we have many situations that burden us, many situations where we need, Lord, a breakthrough. We need you to, to, to work in that situation. So I just, I pray for the ones that are not spoken. There's probably many of them here, um, that people are dealing with issues that keep them up at night, issues that they're trying to resolve. And I just pray that we would, you know, be faithful in the small things and be committing those to you in prayer and trusting you to work. Uh, I do pray for, for Dennis Hatcher. We pray for his physical healing. I thank you that his brother Doug is there in Florida with him right now. Lord, I, I pray that you'd minister to them spiritually and they would see your hand of presence and power in their lives, Lord, as they are walking through this together. Um, I, I do pray for Tremaine's friend. Um, pray for Megan, Lord, that you'd draw her to yourself uh, through this time of physical suffering that she would uh, know your presence and power in her life, Lord, and she would ultimately know you intimately. So we commit that to you. We thank you that we can pray, that you hear us when we pray. We thank you that you're, uh, you're not a God that's distant, but you're a God that's with us. And we ask you, Lord, as we go through your word today, that we would just see you in all your goodness and glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
All right, let's take a minute to wave to our neighbor. Hello, neighbor. And also, um, Julia, you're going to take the kids out now, right? So kids can go with Julia. All right. The students usually have activity packets they can do, so um, good times. Thanks, Jules, for doing that. All right. Let's open our Bibles. I'm going to read a little bit of the Bible, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'll teach it. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 22, verse 21, and I'm going to read through 2311, and I'm going to teach that this morning. Acts 22, 21. And just to remember, Paul is standing before the Jews, and he says this in 21. And he said to me, this is God speaking to Paul, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They listened to him up to this statement, and that's the council, the Jewish council. Then they raised their voices and shouted, away with such a man from the earth. He should not be allowed to live. As they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out what reason why they were shouting against him that way. But when they had stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? And the centurion heard this and when the commander and went to and went to the commander and told him saying, "What are you about to do for this man is a Roman?" The commander came and said to him, "Tell me, are you a Roman?" And he said, that's Paul, yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, but I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let him go. And the commander was also afraid when he found out he was a Roman because he had put him in chains. But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priest and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. Paul looked intently at the council. Uh, Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest, um, Annas, uh, commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed tomb. Do you sit and try, try me according to the law, but in violation of the law, order me to be struck. The bystander said, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But perceiving that one group of Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. And he said this, and there occurred a great dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the whole assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angels, nor a spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. And there occurred a great uproar, and some of the scribes in the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or angel has spoken to him. And a great dissension was developing. The commander was afraid Paul would be torn into pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. But on the night... Immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly testified or witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, you must also witness, you must witness at Rome also. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how clear it is. We would pray that... You would open our ears, open our hearts, open our lives, and that we would take your word in, and that it would become part of how we think and part of how we live. 
Father, strengthen us today to walk in your presence, to know the glory of that. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you flip over to Hebrews 13, I want to read a few verses for you. And as I do, I just want to remind you of something about the Christian faith. And you may know this very well, or it may be new to you. But one thing that's interesting about the Christian faith is the Christian faith is the only belief system that the, the temple comes to, the, comes to a building to worship. The Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Judaism, they have a temple. Um, in other faith systems, they have a locational worship they have to do. Uh, in the belief system of Christianity and the Christian faith, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the repository of God by His Spirit. And so He says this to us in Hebrews 13. I'm in verse 5. Make sure your character is free from the love of money. Why is it important that our way of life, that's what our character means, how you live, your way of life, why is it important to be free from the love of money? Because there's a linkage, and listen to the linkage. Being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So we don't love money because we love the Lord, and he promised that he wouldn't leave us or forsake us. He would take care of us. So we trust him. Verse 6. So we so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Now, this author through the Holy Spirit is quoting from multiple sources in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 31, Joshua 1. Psalm 118, and when Joshua is called, God says to him, Joshua, uh, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. The Lord will be with you wherever you go. And we sometimes struggle with knowing that God is present with us at all times. His power, his love, his grace, he is with us. Uh, we, we live in a society where too often people have treated um, relationships very cavalierly. And we think about in the business world, you know, if you have a job and somebody comes along and they offer you a better offer, maybe better benefits or, or more, uh, more money or more time off. And so what do you do? You, you leave your place of employment, you break that relationship, and you go to a new relationship because it's a better opportunity. The problem is, is taking that economic model into the realm of your relationships causes many problems and breakdowns, all right? We have a society that is fatherless in many regards. We have a society that has broken families. I mean, I used it in the first service, and I'll use it again, so bear with me. But just imagine if a 19-year-old kid came up to me and said, listen, I need a place to live. And I said, okay, so, and he said, I... I will mow the lawn twice a week. Andrew only mows it once a week. And I will take the garbage out, and Andrew doesn't take the garbage out. And I looked at him and said, you know what? I walked into Andrew's room and said, Andrew, I love you. You're my son, but I got a better bargain from this kid. What's your name again, kid? Okay, this guy, come on in. You have Andrew's room. Andrew, you're out on the street, okay? I mean, that would be completely ridiculous, all right? And, and, and sadly we have moved that into the realm of our marriages, right? America has a problem with marital breakdown because we have a problem with saying we're Christians and actually living out the Christian faith. We love people who've been through divorce. We want to be gracious with that. But we affirm that if you're married, you need to work at it and stay married. There has to be relational consistency and constancy. I would say the same thing in the church setting. How many people, you know, that pastor was here and then he got a better deal, economic realm. He got a better deal from another church and he moved on. And that's okay. And pastors do that. It happens. It's not, a, it happens. And that's why I told you, we wanted to do something where we're here and we're not leaving. Sorry for your luck, but that's the way it is. So there's consistency, there's constancy. So these kids that Julia is ministering to right now, you know, one day, 
will perform their weddings here in this church. That's important to have those ties. And you see, the problem is, is we've, we've attributed that kind of relational breakdown to God. And God says, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I am with you. So we get fear, we get anxiety, we feel like, God, what are you doing? Are you there? Do you hear me? Do you care? And the Bible says very clearly that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. There's a reason why when Christ is born, he is called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And we've got to remember that as believers. It's God with us. And when he leaves and he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, now it's God with us, with Christ. And now post-Pentecost, it's God in us. So we have everything for life and godliness by the power of the Holy Spirit, by God's presence in us. And we need to always remember that his presence is with us. And we need to practice the power of God's presence. That's the title of this morning's sermon. How you practice the power of God's presence. So what does this look like tangibly? Thursday at work, I had some stuff going on. It was outside of my control. And you know what happens when things happen outside your control. Things that are in your control, you can deal with and you're responsible for. Things that are outside your control, you can't. And my wife the night before told me to pray about it. That's good advice. And I was talking to Charles, who hasn't been here since COVID, but really wants to come back and often watches on video. And I'm telling Charles, because we work together, I'm like, Charles, this is going on, and blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me, and he said, because he's got a good sense of humor, he said, well, you can always pray about it, Pastor. And I said, you're right, <laughs> you know? You know? And, and, and the thing is, is we've got to remember that God is intimately concerned about every detail of our lives. It's not just, oh, the spiritual stuff, and the rest, you're on your own. It's, I'm your father, and I care about all of it, and I will work in all of it. And we see this very clearly in the life of the Apostle Paul as he is doing all the right things, and he's attacked. So God's presence is with you even though or even when you're attacked. Let's say you decide to take a stand for Jesus Christ and stand up for him and tell somebody about him, and you get attacked, you get mistreated. God is with you through that. So let's look back to chapter 22, verse 21. The minute Paul says that he was going to go to the Gentiles, I mean, that is the, the spark that ignites this, uh, this blaze. Um, it says, they listened to him up to this statement in verse 22. Now, he was saying to them, God told me, you guys wouldn't listen to me, so I was going to go to the Gentiles. And he had. And now he came back to Jerusalem to speak to them. They listen to this statement, and then they say, Away with such a fellow from the earth. He should not be allowed to live. They were crying out, throwing off their cloaks, and tossing dust in the air. Visualize this. There's these distinguished men with gray beards taking their outer garments and throwing them in the air, and then taking dust from the ground and throwing it in the air and screaming. I mean, we don't see, I mean, we see young people do these kind of things. We don't see seniors doing this kind of things or distinguished looking people doing this kind of stuff, okay? It would have been a crazy situation. And they're yelling out, away with such a man from the earth. They were shouting against Paul. So Paul is now taking a stand for the Lord and he's getting verbally attacked by these men, and now he's about to be physically attacked. It says, uh, the commander ordered that he should be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason they were shouting against him. So they stretched him out. Now this is what the Romans would do. The Romans would take you, and if they had an accusation against you, what does the Old Testament say about an accusation? Let everything be established by two or three witnesses. Right? The basis for the Western legal system is in the Old Covenant. 
because it is so clear that you can't self-incriminate. There's got to be multiple witnesses. The witnesses have to be credible. These men are just saying, away with him from the earth. The Romans see an a, a absolutely crazy situation. Remember, Roman, Roman likes like order. There's complete disorder and chaos. So they think, we'll stretch him out. Okay, they get the court reporter in, you know, with his, his uh, quill, and he's ready to write. And what they're going to do is they get out the cat of nine tails. They stretch Paul out. They're about to whip his back. And what happens is by probably the fourth strike, the victim is ready to confess to whatever needs to be confessed. It's how they would solve unsolved crimes. They would just beat people, and they would confess to things whether they did it or not because they were being beaten. And so Paul knows what's going to happen. He's about to be attacked physically for his faith. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, puts these words on Paul's tongue. Listen, to, look at verse 25. When they stretched him out, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, this is what Paul says to him, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? He plays the Roman citizenship card. He plays the, I have a legal right to have a trial and be condemned before you do this. He doesn't say, don't do it, I'm a Roman. He says, is this lawful? Now, what does a centurion go through his mind the many years that? He thinks this guy's maybe an Egyptian. He thinks he's a Jew. He's 99.5% sure this guy is no Roman. And remember, in the Roman Empire, there were citizens and non-citizens. There's a massive distinction between citizens and non-citizens. It's the same way in the Islamic world. They're followers of Islam, and then they're basically the non-citizens who have no voice, who have dimmy status, who have to pay much higher taxes than the Muslims. That's how it works. Actually, in every culture, this works that way. There's always some kind of tribalism. Look all through the world, and this group hates this group, and this group fights this group, and it's always, we're this group and you're not, same way in the Roman Empire. Actually, the antidote to tribalism is the Christian faith. That's the antidote, because then we're all the same, all right? Which is why the pastor that gets slaughtered in Africa is my brother. I've never met him. I'll spend eternity with him, and my heart cries out for him. My Chinese brethren that I'll never, I'll never know probably on this earth who are being rounded up and put into prison, my heart goes out to them because they're my brothers and sisters. I have more in common with them, even though our culture and language is different, than I have with somebody who lives next door to me who doesn't see the world through the eyes that I see them, the eyes of this, the Word of God and the person of Christ. So Paul gets stretched out. He says, this is a law for, for Roman citizens. Then the centurion heard this, or when he heard this, he went to the commander and <laughs> saying, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. He knows that the commander, if he's the one who oversees the scourging of a Roman citizen, is in massive, I mean, massive trouble. I mean, this is a 911 emergency, okay? The commander <laughs> came to Paul and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? Remember, Paul stretched out, ready to be whipped. And he says, yes. You got to think the minute he says that, they're going, oh, we, we got the wrong guy. We got the wrong guy. Then the commander answered and said, and this is hilarious, I acquire this citizenship with a large sum of money. That's one of the ways you can be a citizen. Be a citizen through a certain level of service in the military, or you could pay for it. And what does Paul say? I was actually born a citizen. I was born a citizen. I wasn't born like you, a non-citizen, and had to buy it. I was born a citizen. So they realize at that moment what we're doing is way out of line. There has to be a proper process for this person, all right? It's like, uh, like we have Miranda rights. We have to have our rights read to us. We have rights as citizens. Uh, I was, um, uh, when we, I pastored in, uh, in New York, uh, we lived on the Canadian side because it helped the church because they didn't have to pay for our health care. And so when I was in New York, I would drive around with an Ontario plate, even though I'm born in Ohio, raised in Florida, I'm red, white, and blue, but I had an Ontario plate. And I, I got pulled over by a cop, and, and he cuffed me and threw me in the back of the cruiser because he thought I was a Canadian. I did not remember this passage. I would have looked at him and said, is this lawful for you to do with an American citizen? Because he thought I was a Canadian citizen. He's like, you're going to run back. I'm like, I'm, 
and the funny thing was I was reading the Bible when he did that, and I was reading Romans 13 about being subject to the government. And that's, I should have been reading this passage, and I would have said I'm an American, right? My shoulder hurt for probably a year afterwards. Like when he threw me against the car and started patting me down, like, I, I said, what are you doing? And he threw me in the cruiser. So that was fun. That was fun calling to get uh, one of the guys from church to come pick me up from the jail. That was fun. It was a traffic violation. It's a long story. But, the, but, but here he says, I'm a citizen. He knows he's got rights. And we treat people with different rights, different ways. You're a citizen of America. You have special rights in this country. All right. Therefore, those who are about to examine him, immediately let, let him go. The commander was also afraid because he's got fear when he found out he was a citizen and because he had put him in chains. So what he decides to do is they've attacked Paul for just saying he's, all Paul's done is talk about Jesus Christ. And he's getting bound. He's getting people yelling at him and throwing things. And he's, getting, he's about to be whipped. And now the commander's thinking, okay, how do I fix this? I'm going to take Paul and put him in front of the council. And we can have a proper trial to try to figure out why these religious guys are so angry and want to kill him. So... On the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. So, Ananias is the high priest, and they're about to interrogate Paul. So you've got a whole council. It would have Pharisees and it would have Sadducees. We're about to get to that difference. So, when you're attacked for your faith or your practice about being a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, God's still with you. God hasn't, God hasn't forgotten you. As a matter of fact, when Stephen was martyred, it says he looked into heaven and Christ, who is seated at the right hand, which means his work is done. When do you sit down? When your work's done, right? That's when you rest. Christ is seated at the right hand. It actually says that Christ stood up to welcome Stephen, who was being brutally martyred by this same group. And now Paul, who was the witness to that, is going to stand on trial in front of these same men, knowing Stephen's fate. God was with Stephen. God will be with Paul. God will be with us. Now, let's get to chapter 23. So he's before the council. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. If you go over to the next book, it's the book of Romans. The book of Romans has theology in chapters 1 through 11. 12 through 16 are all practical life application. 9, 10, 11 of the book of Romans deal with the question of the Jews. And as the Holy Spirit speaks uh, through Paul, as he begins this section, 9, 10, 11, dealing with the Jews, he says this in verse 1, I am telling the truth in Christ, Romans 9, 1. My conscience, I am not lying, my conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. So he's telling you, I am not exaggerating. I am not speaking in hyperbole. I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. That I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Why does Paul have great sorrow and unceasing grief? Paul had been all over the world and preached the gospel. He'd always start in the synagogues or with the Jews. And then he'd go to the Gentiles. And he always, most often had people come to Christ. Why is he sorry? For I wish, I, I could wish that I myself were accursed. Or literally, I pray that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ. Why would Paul, who wants to know Christ so intimately, pray that he could be separated from Christ? For the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are the Israelites. Uh, Paul had such love in his heart for the Jews that he wanted to see them come to Christ. 
And he said, even if it cost him his own eternity with Christ, he wanted his brethren to come to faith. So with that as the backdrop, this is Paul's shot. This is Paul's shot that he's wanted his whole ministry. He's been going to the Gentiles. He's been all over what is modern-day Turkey, into Greece, into Europe. He's had many Gentiles come to faith in Christ. He loves the Gentiles, but he self-identifies with these men. He grew up around them. He was trained alongside them. These guys are the guys he knows so well. They are his long-term He's known them for a long time. And now he's got his shot to clearly present the gospel and that they will come to Christ. This is that moment he's been waiting for. When he finishes that, I have lived perfectly with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest, Ananias, commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. I hate when people, they can't endure words. So he strikes him like, shut up, hits him in the mouth. Now Paul, who is speaking, this is his chance he's been waiting for, answers to the person who hit him and also to Ananias, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you strike me according to the law and in violation of the law? I'm sorry, do you try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? So he calls him out for violating the law that they believed in because you're not to hit someone when they are on trial like that. That was against the law. And he calls them a whitewashed wall. You think about whitewashed tombs. And the reason they would whitewash them is because if you touched a tomb, you were unclean. So if you put white on something, you could always see fingerprints. Right? We, Catherine and Jen just repainted our dining room area a beautiful, I don't even know what the color is, but it's darker green. Am I right? It's like a greenish? Kind of, sort of. It's darker than it was. It was a lot lighter. And when I saw the darker paint going on, I was like, this would be great when we had, because you had dogs. So this is good. We're going for it, right? You paint something white, you can see every fingerprint. So they'd want to make sure that, the, the, you know, don't touch this. If you touch it, you can see your fingerprint. So that's why they'd use that term, whitewashed walls. It was something that was dead on the inside, but painted white on the outside to try to, to, try to warn people from touching it. And it was considered um, rotting. And then... This is where we believe that Paul had an eyesight problem because a bystander says, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was unaware, brethren, that he was the high priest. So we think that he probably had an eyesight problem. And when he yelled back at the high priest that God is going to strike you, which he did two years later, um, that he couldn't, couldn't make him out that he was Ananias. So that's, that, there's some conjecture there, but that would make sense. Um, and then he quotes the Old Testament, for you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So that's clear that Paul now shows them, I know the Old Testament as well as you, and I realized I, I violated that because I didn't know it was, and I'm violating it, and I'm acknowledging that. Now, perceiving the, that the group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee, and I'm on trial for the hope and the resurrection of the dead. Paul gets his chance. Um, he's been waiting for it. He goes right to the resurrection of the dead. He doesn't get caught on this, this red herring of striking the mouth and the high priest and all this. That's all dealt with very quickly. And he gets right to the resurrection of the dead. And sometimes Christians, when people ask you about your faith... You know, they want to ask about every other question. What's your view on, you know, creation and evolution? And don't get caught up in that. Get right to the resurrection of the dead and right to Jesus Christ. Okay? If they get, if they get it all fixed with Jesus Christ, they'll understand that we have to have a creator God. And then he says this. I'm on trial for the hope and the resurrection of the dead. 
And, he, and as he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. So immediately, this group that's united against Paul divides. And they divide very clearly along the lines of Pharisees and Sadducees. And the reason they divide is explained to us in the next verse. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit. So the Sadducees believed, you read the first five books of Moses, you follow those first five books, the rest of the Old Testament, the other 39, um, are lesser than those, and that's what you follow. And there's, Judea, there's sex in Judaism today that would say that, that the Torah is what we follow, and the rest is subservient to the Torah. It's a little like what we call progressive Christians that would hold to somewhat of the Gospels and kind of not pay attention to the rest of the Bible from Acts on. They don't really pay attention to the Old Testament or the New Testament, just the Gospels. So that's the Sadducees. So they believed in no, they were materialists, no supernatural. The Pharisees acknowledged them all. The Pharisees believed in resurrections. They believed in angels. They believed in spirits. They believed in a supernatural. And they actually studied the whole Bible, not just the Torah. When you hear of, um, there's a great book called The Chosen, written by Chaim Potok, and they would talk about Pilpal and how they would study um, uh, the Talmud, and the Talmud was rabbinic explanations of the Torah, and then they would kind of go back and they would argue over the interpretations. All they were looking at was the first five books of Moses, and they weren't really even looking at the original source. They were looking at the commentary on that, and then they would argue over the commentary. And that's one of the reasons why modern-day Judaism is so far from what the Bible says because they've got commentary and explanation of the commentary. And so it's about four, um, it's, about, it's removed about four times from the original source. So, and there occurred a great uproar. And some of the scribes in the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly. We find no, nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel spoken to him. And a great dissension developed, and the commander was afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to take him down and take him away by force and bring him into the barracks. So Paul talks about the resurrection. Chaos happens, and he's whisked out of that place that he'd been longing to be, and he's taken to the barracks, and you got to think. He finally had his chance. It's like if you have a a brother or a sister or a family member that doesn't know the Lord. And, you know, you have that door open and you think, oh, man, this is the door I've been waiting for to talk to them about Christ. And it doesn't go well. What happens? Well, let's look at the next verse. But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side. Back to God's presence with you. When you feel you've failed, God stands with you. His presence is with you. And then he says to you these, these words, take courage, okay? Paul actually wasn't a failure, although he probably felt that way when he was in front of the council. He spoke of the resurrection. That's what he was called to do. We've got to be faithful and trust God for the results, all right? In Matthew, it talks about if you're faithful with the small things, you'll be given more to be faithful with. And so when we talk about the regimen of reading the Bible and being in prayer and taking those steps and being faithful, walking with the Lord, those are the little things, the basics. And I've told you before, man, good sports teams that are successful, that win championships, everyone knows it's because they do the basics better than everybody else. That's why. They do the basics. They just do them over and over again. Believers who do great things for God do the basics, all right? When uh, Jen and I were dating, she spent a lot of time practicing piano. And I used to laugh. People, when she'd play, they'd say, man, I wish I could play like that. And I'd think, do you want to practice like she practices? It's a lot. You want to be a really close and intimate with the Lord, do the basics. Be consistent. He stands with Paul. He says, take courage. Do not worry. 
you get worried, you need to go back to the Lord and pray it, pray about it. Leave it at his feet. Cast all your anxiety on him. He cares for you, it says in 1 Peter 5. It says, for you have solemnly witnessed to my cause in Jerusalem. So he's saying, you were a witness. You did what you were told to do in Jerusalem. That's a small thing. Jerusalem's a small city. In the Roman Empire, it's a small city. It's an, it's, it's an outlying province. Okay? It's not a major area. It'd be like a Utah to us. Okay? Like a, like a small, you know, not overly populated, not that influential. It was for Jews, but for the Roman Empire, it was just an, an outback place. He says, now, you've been faithful in the little things. So you will be, so you must witness at Rome also. The nerve center of the empire, you're going to go there, Paul, and you're going to be a witness there. You were faithful in Jerusalem. Now you're going to Rome. This verse is going to be the guiding verse for the rest of the book of Acts because Paul's pushing to Rome from here out. Because he's like, God's called me to Rome. I'm going to Rome. I'm going to Rome. And he actually feels freed that he's been faithful at Jerusalem. Because God has stood by him. So, some application. When you feel that you failed, and I love it because I misspelled feel. Don't you love that? It's like failure. I, it, it, I just want you to know that your pastor fails sometimes. So there you go. I just want you to know God is still with you. God's still with you. He's so with you. Okay? And be, be consistent in the little things and let God bless you with the bigger things. And be consistent in those little things so you're closer to him, so you feel his presence and his power with you. When everyone around you is acting like this council, and they're yelling, and they're throwing dust in the air, and they're throwing their outer garments in the air, you be that believer that's got their head on straight, that says, God is in control. I will not be shaken. And one of the things that COVID has done is it's shown us as believers that we need to make sure we are communicating we trust God and we trust his sovereignty. And we need to not, I'm not saying you don't take precautions. I, I do get hand sanitizer and all that. But what I am saying is, I am not worried about getting the virus and dying. I'm not. I'm not worried about getting killed in a car accident. God has an appointment for me to die, okay? So as long as I don't do something stupid, like try to, you know, eat toast when I'm taking a bath, I'm good, all right? Just, you gotta be faithful and trust the Lord. And people are concerned about food shortages. There may be food shortages. Will God take care of us? If he can feed Elijah with ravens by the book Cherith, he can take care of us. We're his children. What do you think, he's on break? He's on vacation? He's tuned out to us? No way. He will take care of us. He's promised. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. We need to be the people. And right now, with all the tumult in our country that just keeps our heads on straight, keeps talking about Jesus, keeps talking about his love, keeps talking about how awesome he is, keeps talking about how he heals and he, and he, he breaks every chain. People feel bound and chained and upset about life. Jesus Christ is the answer. He always has been. He always will be. And it's ironic in a time when our nation needs the church, the governments in places are trying to close the church and keep it closed. It is the antidote to the malady, which is a sin condition in our nation. So I say to you lovingly, let's be faithful in the small things. Let's realize God is with us, and let's take courage so people can look and say, God, you know what? There's something different about that person. They're not bound up with fear because you don't have to be because God's got it, okay? God's got it. It's good. He's got it. He's got it. We just need to trust that and walk with him. Lord, thank you for uh, this great testimony of the Apostle Paul, how he stood before this council, and how he, Lord, talked of the resurrection, which is the answer to the problems of this world. Jesus Christ is alive. 
And Lord, I thank you for these dear people who are here and those who are watching it. And I just pray that they would realize today as your word has been read and taught that you are with us. Let's be faithful in the small things. Let's let you bless us, Lord. Let's know that you're present. Let's not be caught up in the worry and anxiety of the world. But let's just trust you every day to be who you are. Our Father, Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, thank you that you break every chain. And I pray this morning for those watching, those who are here, if there is a chain that is binding them, a fear or anxiety or something they're into, Lord, I just pray you'll break it by the power of Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. Please stand with us as we worship. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. All sufficient sacrifice, so freely given, such a To 
Good to see everybody every week. Everybody have a blessed week.